Hello everyone, welcome back. So we have just finished with uh, integrating our characters into the dialogue files, which means now we're ready to move on to the other systems that are going to polish off our visual novel. In this episode, we're going to be working on finally changing this background image. So we're going to get layers working. We're going to get our background, cinematic foregrounds, whatever other kind of layers you might use. And specifically, we're going to start putting pictures uh, and videos onto these different layers. So to prepare ourselves for this, we're going to import some assets that we're going to use, including some shaders to actually get these transitions working in a nice way. Uh, and some material, as well as some textures that we can use for this project. So let's go ahead and create ourselves a little folder inside of our main folder called shaders. And we'll just import the shaders used for this system. So you can go to the description and download these items. The first two things will be our shaders. One that'll use a blend texture and one that'll just transition with a circle. So let's go ahead and drag these into our shaders folder. Once they're in, they should compile as long as you're in URP. And if you open it up, then you can see the shader that I have made for this purpose. I am not the best shader writer in the world. I'll put that up front. This works, it gets the job done, but it could be better. But let's go to resources and let's make a new folder in here called materials. That way I can show you what I'm talking about. Inside of the assets that you download, there's also a layer transition material. So let's go ahead and drag that into our materials folder. And then this here, it will have a hidden internal shader error. So let's just go ahead and select our, our shader here, which is going to be located under shader graphs. And then it will be one of these two. I'm going to use the blend text. So that way I could show you what I'm talking about. There's also a folder called graphics. And we'll go ahead and import that into resources as well. This one may take a little bit to import because it has some background images and videos and some blend textures that we'll be using for the system. Inside of graphics, we've got background images, which has a whole bunch of little different pictures here, which I've downloaded from online. And we've also got background videos, which I downloaded from YouTube. And then some gallery images that we can test for our gallery system later on as well as some transition effects. And these are the blend textures that I'm talking about. So real quickly, let me go ahead and enable a raw image over the top of this whole canvas. And I'm going to drag in a texture into our material here. So this raw image, I need to assign the material here. So we'll do, we'll assign the layer transition material to this texture. I'll open this up, come down here. So how this works is we have a blend texture field which we will assign one of our transition effects to. But I'll go ahead and set a image onto the actual texture of the raw image, just like so. And then come to transition effects, and I'll choose something like hurricane. And put that into my blend text. Now, if I blend, you'll see that it starts fading out in sort of that blending manner. But it's not as uh, perfect as I would like it to be. And I'm not sure how I would fix that. But it does work for the time being, so... It, maybe we can improve on that later. But we can see how it uses this grayscale image to transition the image in and out, depending on whatever it is that we've selected. And of course, the reason all this is located in resources is we need to load all of this at runtime. So let's go ahead and close that out. And now that we're having, now that we have all of this stuff imported, let's go into our scripts and let's go into core and set a new folder up for our layer transitions. And this is actually going to be called our graphic panels. So our background, cinematic, and foreground are all going to be graphic panels. And we're going to need several scripts in order for this system to work. First off, we're going to need a manager that's going to handle all of the panels. So let's create a new C-sharp script and call it a graphic panel manager. The next thing we want is the thing for it to control, which is a graphic panel. Now each graphic panel is going to have a graphic layer, and that means we can have multiple images that are controlled on one 
uh, panel. So we have a special image in here called Spaceship Interior, which if I come in and just duplicate the raw image on our background, just a little placeholder, and replace that with the Spaceship Interior, we can see that it layers on top of the other background. So we have a layered background panel here. And each layer is going to have its own image, and we'll be able to stack them in case we want stacked effects, just like that. So let's go back to our scripts folder and make a script just for that. Where was it? Okay, there we are. We'll go ahead and create a C-sharp script and call it the graphic layer. And lastly, the layer is going to have a graphic object, which is a representation of either an image or a video and all of the functions that are available to it. So one more script for a graphic object. So our panel manager will control, it'll have a list of all the panels and control which ones are displaying what, and our panels will have a list of layers which will allow us to create as many images as we want, and each layer is going to have assigned active and other inactive graphic objects, just so we can control what's fading in and what's fading out and render the correct image on screen. Real simply, we're going to delete these uh, things and just create ourselves an instance that we can access statically. Of course, remembering to only make it publicly retrievable and privately assignable. And then in awake, let's go ahead and set the instance to equal this. Now, secondly, what we want is we want a list of all the panels that are available to us. So we'll make a private list. Actually, let's make it an array because we don't really need the functions of a list. So a graphic panel array called all panels. And so we can assign these from the editor. Let's go ahead and serialize the field. Next, we're going to want some default transition speed for our images and videos to fade in at. So we'll make this a public constant float called the default transition speed and set that equal to 3. Now, let's open up the graphic panel and so we can actually edit it from the um, editor interface. Let's go ahead and remove mono behavior, but let's make sure that we proceed this with system.serializable. That's why it's serializable inside of the inspector. And let's go ahead and give each panel a name. So we'll make a public string for the panel name, just whatever it's going to be called, and we need to reference what the actual panel is inside of our UI. So we'll access the game object for this panel and just call it the root panel. And then, of course, we want a list of any active layers that we're using. Now, this doesn't need to be public, so we'll make this a private list of our graphic layers and call this layers and just set it equal to a new array or a new list. Now, when we're using the panel manager, we should have a way that we can easily go ahead and try to get whatever panel it is we're searching for by name. So let's make a function that will return the panel based off whatever name we give it. So public graphic panel get panel. And we'll take in a string for the name. And now let's look at for each, let's take a look at all of the panels in our list. Let's just check it in a case insensitive format. So if panel dot panel name dot to lower equals Right, so we're not doing this for every loop. We'll say name equals name dot to lower. And then just check name. If we have that panel, let's go ahead and return it. Otherwise, we'll return null because the panel we're looking for does not exist. So for each panel, in order to display an image or video on screen, we need to create a layer for it to render on. And we'll go ahead and make a function that will try to see if we have a layer and return that layer to us if it exists. So let's make a public graphic layer returning function called get layer and we'll take in an integer for the layer depth. And now we're going to iterate through our whole array. So for int i equals zero while i is less than layers dot 
count i plus plus and we're going to be looking for if layers i we need to look for the layer depth on this particular layer so if we open up our layer all we need to do is just add a public integer called layer depth which will default to zero and so when our panel is searching to see if this is the layer we're looking for we'll just say if that layer's layer depth equals the layer depth that we're searching for if it does then return that layer otherwise return null As well as getting a layer, we also need to be able to create a layer if we're trying to make one at a certain depth. So let's also make ourselves another function. We'll make this one private because we'll do everything via the get layer command. But we'll do, we'll make it return the graphic layer object type and call it create layer. Once again, passing in an integer to the layer depth. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start by making a new layer. And now we need to create a panel that's going to hold the image. So what's happening is we have a panel for our background. And when we create a layer, we're going to create another object. And then that object is going to be what holds the actual image that we're trying to display. Because as we create new images, we're going to duplicate and just add a new, a different texture, a different video, and then fade out the inactive one and fade in the active video. And it'll be much easier if we organize these into their own separate objects. So let's go ahead and create the game object for that. Let's make a game object called the panel, which is going to be a new game object. And we're going to call it under a certain format. So Let's define the format for this name up above. Actually, let's go ahead and define that in the layer class itself. So we'll make a public constant string for the layer object name format and set that equal to something like layer and whatever number it is that's going to be there for that layer. So then, as we assign that name, we'll do a string.format, the graphic layer dot layer name format, as well as the layer depth that we are applying to this layer. And this object is going to be on the UI. We're going to make it a, a parent or a child on the UI, but it's not going to have a rect transform on it automatically. So we need to create one. We'll go ahead and make a rect transform called the rect, which will be the equal to the panel dot add component and add a rect transform to control the total visibility of all the images on this panel what we'll also do is say panel dot add component and we'll add a canvas group and then let's go ahead and parent this onto our UI so our panel dot transform dot set parent and we're going to set the parent to the root panel dot transform. And now when we create this object, it's not going to be scaled to the size of the canvas by default. So we need to set the anchors as well. So let's say rect dot anchor min, good lord, anchor min, there we go, equals vector two dot zero. And then rect.anchor max is going to equal vector2.1. And now we'll go ahead and set the offset as well. So rect.offset min equals vector2.0. And then rect.offset max equals vector2.1. So we are scaling this thing to the size of its parent panel, which would be the whole scale of the UI. And now let's go ahead and set the actual panel that is assigned to this layer. So, so we need to keep track of that by adding it into our graphic layer. Let's go ahead and give ourselves a public transform and we'll call it the panel. And when we create this, we'll say our layer dot panel equals the panel that we've just created dot transform 
and we need to assign the actual layer depth so we can keep track of it. So layer dot layer depth equals the layer depth. And by default, whenever you create a new object like this, it's just going to be stacking it inside of the hierarchy. So you'll notice as we duplicate items, they keep spawning beneath each other, and whatever is spawned last is rendered on top. So we want to make sure that all of the layers that we create are actually spawned in the correct order. So if we create layer 2 and then create layer 1 afterwards, if we do it traditional way, layer 1 will still overlay layer 2. But we want to go in and make sure that each one of them is set in the proper sibling index order. So let's check and see if we have any layers that are greater than the actual layer depth that we're working with. We'll cache this into a variable called index, and so that's it's equal to layers.findindex. And we're going to find the index of the layer where the layer dot layer depth is greater than the layer depth that we're working with. So if that's true, we want to inject this layer into the proper index and make sure that it's above the ones below it but beneath the ones that are higher than it. Now if that's not the case we could just add it to the very end of the list and it doesn't matter. So let's go ahead and check first of all if uh, index equals negative one. If it's negative one we had no match and we can just say layers dot add the layer. Otherwise we'll do layers dot insert, and we're going to insert it at the index that we found, and pass in the layer. So our list is going to maintain the order, and now let's sort the objects in the hierarchy. So let's go through each one for int i equals zero, while i is less than layers.count, then i plus plus, and let's do something with each of the layers. So layers i dot panel dot set sibling index to layers i dot layer depth. And at the very end of it all, return our layer. So we should go ahead and create the layer and make sure that it's assigned at the right spot and keep everything rendering in the correct depth. Now in get layer, let's go ahead and specify a boolean to say create if does not exist. Set that equal to false by default, but if creative does not exist, then we're going to go ahead and return create layer and just create the layer at that depth. Otherwise, we will return nothing. So we can get we can go ahead and create our layer. Now, if we take this into Unity, let's go ahead and add a new manager for our graphic panel manager under managers. And let's go ahead and add the graphic panel manager script. And what we have here is a list of panels. If we add one, we have an element with a panel name, which I will go ahead and make the background. And I'll assign the background object as the panel. And I no longer need the raw image, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And let me just go ahead and run a test real quick. I've gone ahead and applied a new testing script called Graphic Layer Testing. And inside of here, all I'm doing is accessing the panel manager and getting the panel called background and then getting the layer zero. And we should see a layer created if I go ahead and specify true to create it. And what we should wind up with is a new object called layer and followed by the layer we created as a child of the background. And if we look at that in the scene view, our layer should actually be scaled up to the size of the actual canvas here, which we can see by the rec transform and the anchors. Cool, so now that we know that's working, we can go ahead and create the logic for our layer. So let's start simple and let's just start with creating a basic texture. Inside of our graphic layer, let's remove start and update. And we're going to be making just a couple functions here. The first function is the one that we want to actually create the texture. So we'll make this publicly accessible with a void return type and we'll call this set texture to apply an image to the layer. And the way that we're going to run this is we're going to load all of the images that we want to actually create for the backgrounds and what have you 
uh, loading them from resources, which means we're going to need a file path to load them by. Now, in case we don't want to use a file path and we just want to pass in a direct texture, then we can go ahead and make sure that we allow ourselves to do it both ways by loading it via file path or loading it via a directly assigned texture. So the first way we'll do is through resources. And so we'll just specify a file path where this actual image exists at. And then how about we give ourselves a transition speed, which defaults to just one. And then also, we have the ability to just fade in the images or use that little shader to actually use a blending texture to fade it in a different way. So we'll also specify optionally a texture called the blending texture and just default that to null. So by default, the images will just fade in. Okay, and then our next function, public void set texture again, but this time instead of specifying a file path, we're going to specify a texture called text. We'll take those same parameters for transition speed and blending texture, and if we load by the file path, let's go ahead and try to find the texture within resources. So texture text equals resources dot dot load and we're going to try to load a texture from the file path. So this should be a file path relative to the actual resources folder. And let's check if we got one. If text is not equal to null, then let's go ahead and log ourselves a message. Now, if it does exist, however, then let's go ahead and pass it in to the other function that takes in the direct texture. There we are, just like that. Now, if we have this texture, then we want to go ahead and set the transition speed for this layer and go ahead and create whatever graphic it is that we're trying to apply. So let's quickly make the function that will actually create the graphic. This function will be able to create both a texture and a video, so we'll just pass in T for type in this uh, function here. We'll make it a private void, which we'll call create graphic. And then, of course, Use the T type, and T will be whatever our graphic data is, be it a image or a video, just because we don't want to duplicate code uh, unnecessarily. So we'll reuse this function for both types, and we'll just cast it depending on which one we want to use. Let's also go ahead and take in the file path, and this is not going to be useful for right now, but it is something that's going to be useful for later, specifically when we get into saving history states. We won't be able to save textures or videos directly, but we can save the paths to those images and textures. So we'll be saving the file path directly within the actual graphic object, and it'll keep track of where its own resource is located at. That way, when we go to save and load, we can just load back from that original path. So we'll go ahead and pass in the file path as well. And then let's go ahead and check if we're using a video, then we'll specify an option to use audio for video. By default, that will be true. Maybe you don't want your background videos to use audio, in which case you would set that to false. And of course, let's go ahead and try uh, to see if we have a blending texture as well. So texture blending texture equals null by default. Oh, and I almost forgot, we also want to pass in the transition speed for how fast we want this to fade in. So float transition speed will also be required. Now, for the purpose of uh, abiding by save and load availability, where we can save the file path of a texture, even if we pass in the direct texture, we can still optionally pass in a string for the file path by saying the file path is just empty by default. Now, when we call to set the texture, we'll also pass in that file path. Again, it is not important for actually creating the graphic on the layer, but it is important later for when we go to save and reload the textures in our actual save files. So we'll go ahead and do that for now. And now in our set texture where we pass in the texture directly, let's go ahead and create the graphic and make sure that we just pass in the texture so it knows that T is the texture type. Let's go ahead and pass in the transition speed and the file path that we're using as well as the blending texture if we're using one 
And now in create graphic, let's create a new graphic object cache where we can assign the object that we're creating on this layer. We'll just call that new graphic and let's go ahead and open up the graphic object and give us the ability to create something. So our graphic object is going to need a couple things to keep track of. First off, we need whatever is rendering the graphic, be it the texture or the video, and this is just going to be a raw image. So we'll go ahead and assign a raw image called the renderer for this object. And we'll want a boolean to make it easy for us to know if this is a video or not. But in order for us to know that, we need to see if there's actually a video player that has been assigned to this object or not. Since the video player is what plays the videos for the raw image, Naturally, we can check if we have one or not and just set our boolean is video to true if we do have a video. So first, let's go ahead and make a way to assign a video player if this is for a video. If video player is not showing up, let's make sure that we're using the Unity Engine dot video namespace. Okay, so we have video and now let's make our little boolean public bool is video and just return true if video is not equal to null. If we do have video, then we may also have audio that's playing with the video. So we can give ourselves an audio source for the audio and set that to null by default. And as we're passing in a file path to make sure we can save and load them, look at all these extra namespaces. Get rid of that stuff. Then we can just go ahead and make sure that we save the graphic path, so that way when it comes time to save these layers, we can go ahead and save the path that we'll reload later. Public string graphic path is empty. And this does not need to be a mono behavior, so we can remove that. Now let's make a way to create a new graphic object. So let's make a constructor. We'll take a string for the file path or the graphic path and make sure that we assign this dot graphic path to equal what we just created. And now let's make a new object in the scene that will hold this data. So this will just be a game object. We'll call it OB and set it to a new game object. And let's make sure that its transform is parented to the layer that we're creating this on, which means we're going to need a reference to the layer as well. So let's make graphic layer, layer our first parameter, and then say ob.transform.setParent, and we'll set it to the layer.panel. Next, we need something to actually render this stuff on. So let's add a raw image component to it. component raw image and it'd be nice if we can cache the name of this graphic that way we can check and just make sure that uh, we're not using any graphics by the same name or we're trying to create one of a duplicate type so let's give ourselves another public string for the graphic name and say graphic name equals the name of the texture that we're trying to assign. Let's make sure we also include the texture here. We'll just call it text so we can pass it in there and say our graphic name equals the texture dot name. Now we're going to have a problem if we don't initialize this graphic. It's not going to be the same size as the canvas. So we need to make sure that we go ahead and do the same thing that we did for our layer to this object. So that way it inherits the size of the layer. Let's create a function down here, which will be a private void called init graphic for initialize graphic. First thing that we're going to want to do is make sure that we are centered on our graphic layer. So we can go ahead and say renderer.transform.position. We will say local position equals vector 3.0. That way it starts off directly on the, uh, the panel position. And then renderer.transform.localscale equals vector 3.1, so it's the size of its parent. 
And now let's make sure that we set the size of the actual rect transform and the anchors that go along with it. So let's go ahead and add a rect transform component and set this equal to renderer dot add component. Now for this rect transform, let's go ahead and apply the offsets and the anchor positions. We'll do like we normally do, setting the min and the max anchors, as well as the min and the max offset, to 0 and 1 respectively. And so we can initialize the graphic right after we create the name. And speaking of the name, we should go ahead and assign a name to this object as well. So let's make a format for it like we did for our layer. A private constant string called the name format. And this will be a graphic followed by the graphic name inside of brackets. And then let's go ahead and set the name. So a renderer, which is the object, dot name equals string dot format. And we'll pass in the name format as well as the name of the texture. So text, or we could pass in just a graphic name since we did assign that a second ago. And now we have to apply the texture to the actual renderer. We can do this fairly easily just by saying renderer.texture equals text. But you know what I just realized? We're not actually getting our renderer yet. So let's make sure that we assign a renderer to equal the output of ob add component raw image. That way we will actually assign stuff to our renderer. Now, let's go ahead and actually create that graphic. So, let's do a quick check. If graphic data is texture, if it's a texture type, then we want to make sure that we say our new graphic is equal to a new graphic object, passing in this as the layer, and then the graphic path will be the file path, and then the texture will be the graphic data as texture. By doing this, we should be able to set a texture on our layer. Inside of resources, graphics, background images, we've got all these different images. So I'm going to go ahead and load up just the simple image called two. So I can grab my panel by getting the panel background from our panel manager and then get the create the layer. And then on our layer, we can say layer.setTexture, and we can pass in the file path of the texture that we want to load, which would be inside of resources, graphics, and then BG images, followed by two. And our other parameters can just remain null right now, because all we want to see is this graphic get created. Now, I noticed two issues in the console. First, we're trying to create a mono behavior from the new keyword, which means I forgot to take mono behavior off of one of the classes. And also, I'm failing to load the graphic, even though that is the correct path. Both of these issues are within the graphic layer. First of all, we can remove mono behavior. It should not inherit from that class. Secondly, of course, I went ahead and said if texture is not null, meaning if we've gotten it, then there's an error. It should be if texture is null. The next issue, if we rerun that, is I forgot that when we actually create the raw image, the rect transform is created with it. So we can just change add component to a get component here. And after correcting those small little errors, we can see that we do get the image which is created on screen having this correct background. We can see layer 0 now has a graphic called 2. Now that we know it's creating the graphic properly, we're clear to move on to the next step. That next step is going to be assigning the material to the raw image. That way we can actually blend and fade in the image using our blending textures if we so choose. But in order for us to do that, we're going to need a reference to actually grab that material. And it is saved in resources, so we'll be using resources to load it. Let's go ahead and make sure that we have a path to that material. So private constant string material path will simply be the path to our material found inside of unity which is resources materials and then the layer transition material 
So as a relative resources path, we'll just say materials and then layer transition material. Now let's make ourselves a function to load that and assign it to the texture. So private void, actually we'll grab the material first. Material, and this will be get transition material. And all this is going to do is it's going to grab it from resources and say, we'll just go ahead and return resources.load and load the material from the path defined above. So instead of assigning this directly to our renderer, what we're going to do is inside of initialized graphic, we're going to add the material to the raw image. So we'll go ahead and say that renderer dot material equals get transition material. Now that's well and good, and that will assign our material with the shader to this actual raw image, but there is an issue that this would present. And that is we're loading the material and not an instance of the material. So to demonstrate this, if we come back into our graphic layer, let's add a line where we can assign our current graphic. Make sure it's only publicly retrievable and privately assignable, and set it to null by default. And when we create our new graphic, at the very end, let's assign our current graphic to the new graphic. That way our layer can keep track of what is rendering on the layer. And if I were to access that graphic inside of the testing script, and then go ahead and set the color on the material to red, then if we look at our inspector before we start Unity, our color is currently white. And this is on the material that is spawned for the images. If we go ahead and hit play, then what's going to happen is, of course, we get our image and the material becomes red. And then we exit play mode. You can see that the actual asset still retains that information because it is the actual asset that we have loaded and placed on that renderer and not an instance. So that's not a good thing to do. What we always want to do, just like we did for our character configuration, is we want to create a clone, an editable clone. That way we preserve the original. So for our graphic object, when we get the transition material, let's first go ahead and say that material mat equals resources.load. And then if mat is not equal to null, we have a material, so we can return a new material, which is a clone of mat. Otherwise, return null. And what this does is allows us to access all of the little variables and parts of the shader for each individual renderer without affecting the original material. So that's perfect, and now we can proceed again. So when we assign this material to our images, there are several different fields that we can use. We can either use the color like we were messing with a second ago, and we can also set the main texture. We can then set a blend texture, which controls how it may come in. These are the two fields right here that are very important, the alpha and the blend. So if we're not using a blend texture, we're just going to fade in the material based off of the alpha value. We could go ahead and create a canvas group and then we can affect the alpha that way. But as you can see, when we're using this custom material, the canvas group is not going to work correctly. So we're going to need to instead use the alpha value on this material to change the opacity of the image. Or we could use the blend instead to transition the image in and out based off of the texture that we're using. So we want to make sure that we include the names of these different fields inside of our class. That way it has access to these different fields where it can manipulate them in real time. As we're referencing the path for the material inside of our graphic object, let's go ahead and reference the names of these different uh, variable fields. So these are the different fields that we would use. The color, the main text, the blend text, the blend, and the alpha all following this underscore naming format. That way we can access them directly from the material. So then instead of directly assigning the texture to the raw image, let's go ahead and assign some of these fields. Let's assign the main texture and let's also assign the, the actual intensity of the blending or the alpha. That way it is, it is faded out and we can fade it in when the object is created. 
Since this doesn't matter for texture or video, they'll both be doing the same thing, we can run this inside of init graphic to minimize code duplication. So let's go ahead and say renderer.material.set float. We'll set the blend texture first of all. So we'll say material and then blend and set that to zero. So our blend is zero and we'll also set our material alpha to zero. And the, being that we have the texture inside of the graphic object constructor, we'll assign it in here through renderer.material.setTexture and we'll set the material or main text to text. And now what should happen is when we run testing, nothing should happen. We should see a graphic created, but it should be invisible because both alpha and blend are set to zero. Now at this point, when we go to actually reveal it, if we're using alpha, then we can make sure blend is one and we can just fade it in via the alpha. But if we're trying to blend it, then of course we'll have alpha set to one and then blend in the texture. So with our graphic objects starting invisible, let's go ahead and make it where we can give them the ability to fade in or fade out. We'll do this through two little functions that are on our graphic object class. The first one, We'll make it a public coroutine return called fade in. And there are just two values that we're going to accept here. We're going to take a speed for the fade, so a float for the speed, and then a texture for the blend texture and set that to null by default. Second thing we'll do is we'll add fade out. And both of these are going to call the same I enumerator, private I enumerator, called fading, which will take a float for the target, a float for the speed, and a texture for the blending. And so we don't risk running multiples of these. Let's go ahead and cache any coroutines that might be running. So we will have a private coroutine for CO fading in set to null by default, as well as private coroutine CO fading out. And now if we're fading in, let's see if CO fading out is not equal to null, we want to make sure we stop that. We're going to be running all of this off of our graphic panel manager. So let's make a little shortcut for us here. Graphic panel manager, panel manager equals graphic, or well, use a pointer to graphic panel manager dot instance. So if we are fading out when we try to fade in, then panel manager dot stop coroutine CO fading out. And if CO fading in is not equal to null, then simply return CO fading in. Otherwise, CO fading in equals our panel manager dot start coroutine fading, where we are going to use one as our target alpha, pass in our speed, and our blend texture. And we'll go ahead and return CO fading in. Now we'll do the same thing for fading out by copying that and pasting but this time checking if CO fading in is not null. If it is, we want to make sure that we stop it. And then if CO fading out is not null, then go ahead and return the coroutine that's already running to fade it out. Otherwise, CO fading out equals start the coroutine, heading to zero alpha, and make sure we return the out coroutine. 
So in our layer, after we create the object, we now have the ability to fade it in. Well, halfway, but let's go ahead and make the call. So we'll say current graphic dot fade in. And we're going to fade it in by the transition speed and also pass in our blending texture if we're using one. So whether we're fading in or blending in, we're going to go ahead and use this fading function. So regardless of if we fade or if we blend, we're going to use this same coroutine. So let's go ahead and make the operation where it will take care of these values. So let's go ahead and make it assign the alpha or the blending and make it fade in this new texture. First of all, let's see if we're blending or not. Let's make a boolean called isBlending and set that equal to if our blend is not equal to null. And then let's go ahead and set the texture for our blend text just in case we've assigned one. We can do this by referencing the renderer material and saying set texture and then we're going to find the material blend text that we created earlier. Uh, that's string, so for this parameter we're going to assign the texture as the blending texture. And then we need to set the value of the alpha and the blend values depending on what our target is and depending on if we're blending or not. So let's start with alpha. So renderer.material.setFloat, we need to set this alpha to a certain value. First of all, that material or parameter is material field alpha. And what we're setting it to is uh, depending on if we're blending or not. So if we are blending, let's check is blending. If we are blending, then our alpha just needs to be one because otherwise we'll be blending, but we still won't be able to see anything because our alpha will be zero. Now, if we are not blending, then we need to set our alpha to the opposite of whatever our target is. That way we can fade in or fade out and we'll start at the appropriate value. So let's make one more boolean called fading in and set that equal to if target Is greater than zero. If our target's greater than zero, we're fading in. So let's see if we're fading in, then we want to make sure that our alpha starts at zero so we can fade in. Otherwise, we're fading out. So let's make sure our alpha starts at one so we can fade out. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for our blend text. Material blend is blending. If we're blending, we want to make sure that this starts at the opposite of what our uh, target is. So fading in 0 or 1. But if we are not blending, then we want to make sure that it is set to 1. That way we can just straight up use our alpha and the blending will have no effect on it. Okay, so with that, let's now make sure that we are going to operate on the correct parameter. If we're blending, we need to, from this point forward, just alter the blend parameter and move it up or move it down as needed, and vice versa for alpha. So we can figure out which one we need and cache the actual material parameter name, and then just operate off of that in a while loop. So we'll make a string for the opacity parameter, and this will equal it will do a one more check. If we're blending, then this is going to be our blend parameter. Otherwise, it's going to be our alpha parameter. And now let's make a while loop. While our renderer dot material dot get float, the float of our opacity parameter is not equal to the target, then we need to move it towards the target. So Let's calculate what our new opacity should be for each loop. Opacity will equal, we're going to use mathf to move the current value towards a target. We'll start with renderer.material.getFloat, and we're going to get the opacity of this, and then we're going to move it towards our target by the speed multiplied by time.delta time. And then we can go ahead and set this. So renderer.material.setFloat opacity parameter to the opacity, and then just yield return null so we don't catch ourselves in a uh, constant loop that freezes up Unity. At the end of this, let's go ahead and set co fading in to equal null, 
and CO fading out to equal null as well, so we clear out those coroutines. And now in layer testing, if we start this in a coroutine and just yield for a second before we actually create the texture, we should see it created with zero transparency and then move or fade in gradually. I'm going to remove the color field because we don't need that. And let's just watch and see if it fades in. There we go. It sure enough did. Now, if we go back to testing and load up a blend text from our transition effects and then pass that into text set texture, we should be able to see it apply. As long as we first come back into set texture within our graphic layer and make sure that we are specifying that the blending texture is applying to the actual texture parameter. We do have an optional parameter for the boolean here, uh, which could technically be passed in as true if we're passing in just this blending texture. It could assume it's for that variable, and since they're is a texture. If there is one, it's going to actually set that as a boolean to say that use audio will be true or false, whether we have the texture or not. So that's if we pass it in just with no a specification of the order. So let's make sure that we specify that this is for the blending texture parameter and not to be represented as a boolean for if it exists or not. And now let's launch this in Unity. And we can see, sure enough, our transition effect does work. So that's good enough to stop off this video. We've got our graphics able to be created, or at least our textures anyway. And let's go ahead and pick up in the next video to allow ourselves to add in videos.